you know, it, it's very difficult to follow, not only Patricia Churchland because of the erudition of the lecture, but also she had a cute thing up there with a dog <laughs> and an orang, I mean, it, <laughs> I know. but I think one of the things that I'm hoping that you're getting is that much of neuroscience as it approaches this field of neuroethics is doing exactly what we're trying to do for you here today in this room which is build the science iteratively to the point of departure where it can then become usable in a larger venue. One of the things that my colleague Ed Pellegrino often says is that science cannot tell us how to live. It cannot tell us how to make particular choices, but it can tell us how we make certain choices. It can tell us what certain goods may be valuable to us on a variety of different reasons that range from the very, very biological to the very, very social. But the ultimate issue then is how do we use this? And so, I present to you this. This will be your last lecture before we go to lunch, and then when we come back from lunch, there will be two very important issues that are addressed. What is this thing, neuroethics, and how might we actually be able to use it in practice? Dr. Eric Racine has written, I think, one of the best books about neuroethics that are out there today, and there are several very good ones. And what I like about Eric's book is that it's almost a go-by. It's a map. This is what neuroethics can do. And then he throws the ball to the potential reader and says, now what are you going to do with this? And then the other issue that comes up is that are the ethical issues that we deal with, some of the sexy issues, some of the not so sexy issues, some of the very practical issues, are they handleable? Are they malleable? Are they achievable through the ethical systems that we currently have in play Number one, based upon what we now know about the brain. And number two, based upon what neuroscience and neurotechnology is doing to then change this organism that is the human. And that's what John Shook will discuss this afternoon. So what I'll talk to you about for the next 30, 40 minutes or so is this field, neuroethics, and what it means. And I offer this with a caveat. There is something really sexy about pointing to the brain and saying, that's the mind and then saying this is the seat of morality. And there's something very sexy about that. However, one of the things we have to really avoid is committing the folly of hubris. What do we know? What do we not? What do we do with both of those things? And so that's the coda into how we use the neuroscience we have at hand and how we steer the neuroscience and the use of its technologies towards the future to be able to make ourselves more handy with this information to be able to use it in ways that are not only technically sound, but are in fact ethical, legally good. And that's important. So let me just give you a couple of definitions because you've heard about all this all morning and so I want to reground you to some of these. What does neuro really mean? It means having to do with nervous systems. All the way up, as you heard from this morning, sea slugs all the way right up to senators. And for those of you who are in the Washington DC area, I hold no qualms about which is which. So what we know is that, in fact, as Dr. Churchland said to you, that a lot of the structures that exist in lower mammals, and one might even go so far if one is looking, for example, at the work of Christoph Koch, has to say that there are fundamental brain structures and perhaps even functions that are embellished and are, in fact, adapted and improved, if you will, over different hierarchies of organisms. But many of the essential structures and functions are there, and there's a preservative that goes along with that. If Patricia Churchland calls herself Mother Nature, well, then I'm that bastard stepchild that nobody wants to come home for dinner. And I'm here to tell you that, yeah, there's a lot of similarities in brains, but there's a lot of things that are different, too. And our goal is to figure out which is which. And that's why we talk neuroscience, because science gives us a really good methodological approach. It allows us to steer clear of dogma and utilize a doctrine. And the philosophical construct that I want you to hold about science is that science holds one philosophical premise true. By its nature, science must be self-critical and self-revisionist. If it is not, it ain't science. It's something else. There may be a place for that something else, but we can't call it this. So if we then pair neuroscience, a methodological study of things neurological, and this word ethics, which is not the same as morality, ethics is a systematized study and group of applications and iterations of moral decision making by individuals and groups, we then have this word, neuroethics. But any ethical analysis, as any good philosopher will tell you, must begin with a fact. We have to ask the first question in any form of ethical premise, what are the facts, including the facts about neuro, if we're going to put ethics together with neuroethics? 
And that then brings us to this term, neuroethics. Neuroethics, as defined by Adina Roskies, really manifests what is sometimes referred to as two traditions, two basic tasks, two things that it does. And they're really domains that for a long time was seen as not interactive or being somewhat mutually exclusive, but I, I tend to argue that that's not the case. The first is the older one, which grows out of the old idea of philosophical psychology and moral philosophy, which looks at the neural basis, the biological basis of morality and ethics. We were dealing with that all morning. Much of what Patricia Churchland's lecture dealt with, in fact, handled that, approached that in a very salient and, I think, important way, as did Dr. K. Spears, as did much of the empirical work of Gregory Burns. How are we parsing these decisions that we claim to be moral? Not as if there's some platonic morality out there that we pull down. Morality is a human concept. We may look at the behavior of other species and go, oh, that looks moral. But that's a concept that we've, in fact, created as a construct. And so this is sometimes referred to as neuromorality. It sticks a little here for a number of reasons, and I'll tell you why, and I think there's probably a better term, and I really think that Patricia Churchland's lecture really illustrated for you why this term may be better. And then you have the second tradition, which is the ethical issues that arise in and from neuroscience and its study and its applications in a variety of different domains, healthcare, public life, national defense, intelligence, and security, which has sort of been implied by a number of questions about shooters in Afghanistan and being able to regulate public policy and human conduct through a better understanding of the brain and perhaps its tools. If we understand where in the brain certain processes exist, can we target those? Much of the work we do in the Center for Neurotechnology Studies together with our colleagues in DARPA and DOD are actually looking at the possibility and plausibility as well as some of the fallacies that go along with that. My argument is that these two traditions are not mutually exclusive at all, that they interdigitate. And that their capacity to interdigitate, to mingle well, may create a form of meta-ethics. May allow us to say, how is it that we do ethics? And what do ethics really mean for us, the individuals who develop these ethical systems and claim these things to be analytic and in some way proscriptive or prescriptive for our behavior? So, what do we got? I say that these two traditions are self-contained and maybe a self-referential model, at least in part. And I base that on the fact that neuroscience isn't a singular science, but it really is a convergent science. It brings together genetics, all the classical natural sciences, and increasingly other fields such as physics, anthropology, and ever more, the humanities, into this larger rubric. So, I see some self-containment because we're utilizing neuroscience as a keel, a keel, to then steer our way into understanding the machinations of that organ, which is very important in defining, experiencing, predicting, and establishing our relationality. We heard that this morning already. And I think that as such, as I mentioned to you earlier, these two traditions taken together can be both a lens to peer into objective ways that brains and neural systems work. You heard that from Patricia Churchland. You heard that from Greg Burns. You heard that from Bill Casebeer then what are we going to do with this information? Turn it around and look at ourselves. And ultimately, I heard your questions. Well, these are in animal models. Well, uh, were these in human models? Can this predict human social behavior? We're saying, can you use the lens as a mirror? If we look into nervous systems, what does that tell us about our nervous system? What does it tell me about me? What does it tell me about my relationship to kin and kith, as you heard? If I can look at the relationship of an orang and a dog, what does it tell me between a Christian and a Muslim, for example? Is that helpful? Or is this just some esoteric, really adorable picture that I'm going to steal from Patricia and use it over and over and over again? <laughs> so this then becomes part of the tasks of this field. The tasks are to do this, to understand neural bases of what we consider to be moral decision making. And as you heard from Dr. Burns this morning, there may not necessarily be any real difference between moral decision making and any other form of emotionally driven cognitive decisional process other than the fact that there are social constructs that we then embed within various environments and circumstances. These are weighty decisions for us. Why? Because they have a number of consequences that spread from the meanness of me to my embeddedness in my social dimension. And that may be very important, which may also affect the narratives that we utilize to define what these are. 
It's also perhaps a way of examining if and how neuroscience can and or should even be utilized in various endeavors and circumstances, including the way we look at morality and ethics. It is, in fact, self-referential. I'm a neuroscientist. I became a neuroethicist. I was like a born-again neuroethicist. And I'm here to tell you that there are plenty of things that neuroscience and neurotechnology can do, and there are a whole bunch of things that it cannot. It is our job to try to parse the wheat from the chaff and do that in a way where we don't make extrapolative claims and use the stuff in ways that are technically sound so as to be able to base some type of ethical legal gravitas perhaps upon this. So let's take a look at the first tradition. That is to say, neuromorality. Looking at this, what are the neural substrates and mechanisms involved in moral cognition, intention, and action? We heard all of this this morning. I'm not going to, I, I can't do any better than what you heard. The reason you heard these people is that they are the experts in the field. You heard about how certain forms of Bayesian and non-Bayesian decisional processes can be influenced by emotionality that are environmental, that are developmental and have an evo-devo interaction. We heard that from Patricia Church, and we also heard how these then create values, values the desiderata that parse our decisions and are subjectable to our narratives that may, in fact, affect a variety of mechanisms that steer our will, sometimes what we refer to as free will and or, at very, very least, free won't. So what do we do with this then? A better definition of this tradition is as offered through my colleague Ernst Peppel and I, who in a very recent paper, this is what we offered. It's the cognitive science of resource and relational valuation and decision making. Hey, wait a minute. Look at this. Resources, relational valuation. That doesn't sound like we should be in a neuroscience department. That means that I need a, an appointment in Dr. Burns' department in economics. Echo. Economics. Economos. Keeping house, eco prefix, our household, our niche, proximate distal, kin and kith. A better word here for this is neuroecology. A rational approach to the way an organism engages its nervous system to interact with those areas of its various niches that are of some meaning or value to its survival and the survival of those it holds within its proximate circle of either conspecifics or nonspecifics to be able to have some value for. We argue that this form of study that really defines these ecological mechanisms that neurology has been based upon evolutionarily and developmentally provide a set or foundation for proto-moral basis that we then superimpose upon and say, this is moral. And we do it a variety of different ways. We do it deontologically, we do it consequentially, we do it through a variety of theological and non-theological assumptions that we make, and we do it through our laws. But this provides a set of mechanisms and substrates that are sensitive to these neurological and ecological interactions within the niches that we occupy. Let's look at the second tradition. This then says, are we using the tools in the right way? If you're going to make those claims about neuroecology and say it's the neuroscience of X, Y, and Z, how are you using the science and its technologies? Can you use it in these ways? Should you use it in these ways? And if what you're saying is I'm leveraging neuroscience and neurotechnology to make decisions about morality, ethics, law, and social conduct, we have to be very careful about how it is we're utilizing both the knowledge, the science, and the tools. What this then does is it examines those ethical issues and approaches to neuroscientific research and its uses. And obviously, it's contingent and critical to the first tradition. Why? Because it also provides some insight to the way we as humans deal with the knowledge and tools we have. I speak often in many of the talks that I give about the work of the late George Bugliarello, who coined a term called biosoma. The fact that humans both compensate for their biological weaknesses and maximize and optimize their biological strengths and they do that through our social engagement, both proximately and distally, and increasingly they use forms of machinations. Those tools may be the techne of knowledge and information, or it may be the much more sophisticated techne of technology in its most advanced forms. See also some of the work, for example, of Merlin Donald, tracing the evolutionary cognition pattern of humans throughout its history. But obviously, if what we're going to do is utilize science and technology, to provide insight to the way that humans think and make decisions. And then say this gives us some insight to the way decisions are made, the way brains operate to provide cognitions, emotions that may affect behavior. I told you this morning, 
Humans don't exist in a social vacuum. This obviously expands to the socioeconomic and legal and even political spheres, which was the question I heard earlier this morning. Oh, this neuro brain stuff, wow, that's great. What do we do with it? Well, increasingly you see the neuro prefix used like neuroeconomics, neuro law, neurotheology, neuropolitics. I can't swing a wet rope over my head without seeing that neuro prefix used, and very often it's used inappropriately because there's some assumption that what this is actually doing is saying, well, if we understand the basis of this, this is a wholly reductionistic mechanism. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. What neuro begs is the question, what do we know and what do we don't? I've got no problem tacking that prefix onto a variety of things if we're going to utilize neuroscience as a viable tool in each and all of these tasks. But for heaven's sake, let's use it the right way. So what then are the tools and the tasks that neuroscience cum neuroethics may provide to us? But like any tool, it's in our hands. As you've heard here this morning, this is a wonderful tool because it links me directly into our camera and our video. Unless I use it like this, in which case it does me absolutely no good whatsoever. So I have to use the tool in the right way. It was built the right way, but I have to use it the right way. So what do we see? Well, we know that neuroscience and neuroecology can provide for us a naturalistic orientation to moral cognition and action. You heard that this morning. The three wonderful lectures you heard this morning gave you this on a platter with your donut. It also allows us some form of at least pattern systematic inquiry to our scientific methods, their meanings and their uses. Are we using the science the right way? Are we doing neuroscience in ways that are correct? I'm here to tell you that I see a lot of soft neuroscience. I see a lot of bastardization of terms. I see a lot of terms used such as placebo effect, mirror neurons, affiliation, oxytocin. P Professor Churchland told you this morning about how oxytocin gets bastardized and corrupted. The snuggle hormone, the cuddle hormone. She's right, it's a peptide. Mirror neurons, I mean, what do these mean? What do we take these to mean? In an information age, where we don't necessarily have the scrutiny and scrupulousness of the ivory tower and its intrinsic rigor of peer review, science being the only fuel you're guilty till you're proven innocent. But now it escapes. Something I do in the laboratory or that I let out this afternoon immediately goes viral. This, hello, will go viral. So what's going to happen? We have to be very careful. It, it, it increases the onus of responsibility and the mantle and weight of that responsibility on those of us who do neuroscience and make neuroethical claims. And certainly it increases the need for the directed discourse between those individuals who use that stuff and those of us who do it. Moreover, obviously it is being engaged in the ethical legal sphere. So what we're seeing now is letting the proverbial neuroscientific cat out of the bag and kitty got claws. The issue here is I have no problem letting neuroscience and neuroethics out of the bag, but are we ready for what might get scratched, clawed, climbed upon, and pooped on? When we might have to define where the litter box is and where we put this neuroscience. What things could we retract? Because we very often retract things in science through our self-criticism and revision. But once it's out there in the public domain, these things become neuromyths, neurolalia, neurobabble. And I rabble against that as do my colleagues. So we then take a look at what this thing neuroethics might mean. And these are some viable opinions that have been offered. I'm not going to steal Eric Racine's thunder because he's done a wonderful job of describing these. I'll just leave them up there for you. We can all read a branch of ethics that has specific issues to neuroscience and clinical neurology without a doubt. A form of bioethics or biomedical ethics that focuses on neuroscientific problems, sure. A distinct field because it is in fact predicated on the hard problem of neuroscience, like perhaps not any other area of science, we don't really know where the thing we're studying, consciousness, mind, cognition, its behaviors, how it is evoked from the material substrate brain. We don't know that. We may have to change our entire vision of things. Uh, I'm looking over a field of neuroscientists here in the room. Many of them are my contemporaries. I'll, I'll throw out a word to you. Some of you may know this. Remember Dale's principle? Remember that, Dale's principle? One neurotransmitter is produced by one neuron and one neuron only. That's how we learn the way the brain works. It was wrong. Well, it isn't, we'll just correct a fact. It's correct an entire construct. 
So we have to understand then the uniquity of neuroscience because it deals with these issues that are profound philosophical questions about what does it mean, the whole notion of cogito, the issue of self, etc. Or perhaps maybe neuroethics is a combination, and I would argue that perhaps it is. And it's a combination in that it is what Pellegrino has referred to as a form of hyphenated ethics. Uh, I, Ed Pellegrino is a wonderful mentor, but I don't agree with everything Ed says, and he certainly doesn't agree with everything I say, but we sort of come together on this one. Is neuroethics a branch of ethics? Sure, because it utilizes an ethical methodology, as John Shook will talk to you about this afternoon, as will Eric Racine. Does it engage bioethics as a secondary tier? Well, it ought to, because obviously the substrates of those things that have neural systems are living creatures, they are biological, even though there is a frontier that may deal with cybernetic organisms that increasingly link neural modeling to machines, and we may need a new form of bioethics that deals with that entirely. Some of the work of my colleague Dan Holliter. I don't know if Dan's in the room, he's, he's doing some of that work with us here. And so what do we really see here? Well, I'm fond of this term, and it's not a Giordano neologism. I think it says a lot. I like the term neurobioethics for a number of reasons, not the least of which is I think it preserves these larger set of relationships. It keeps the neuro thing for what neuro is, the ambiguity, the uncertainty, and the contingency there, and it doesn't use that prefix inappropriately. It grounds it to the fact that this bioethics is important because we're dealing with an ethics of living creatures. And it may very well be that the only measure by which we can gauge our moral regard and treatment is certain neurocentric criteria, such as their sentience, panience, etc. And we're certainly seeing that as a part of a shift. Patricia Churchland told you that. Bill Casebeer told you that. Moreover, what we understand is it grounds this form of ethics and the legal and social implications to a type of naturalism of and for biology. Bio logos. I'd love to be the first that said, and I've thought of this myself, but I didn't. The father of the term bioethics, a philosopher in the German tradition named Fritz Jahr. My colleague Hans Martin Sass is a scholar of Fritz Jahr and Jahrian bioethics, actually coined the term bioethics to recognize that those moral issues that are unique to some of those aspects of the philosophy of science as they apply to living creatures demand a revisionist palette upon which to paint. As Jahr said some 80 years ago, as the science changes, so much the philosophy in each and all of its domains. That's very, very true. As Eric Racine will tell you this afternoon, certainly one of the things that must be preserved in neurobioethics is the interdisciplinarity there, and we're beginning to see that more and more. What makes it unique? A number of things. I think there are a number of things that also make it not unique, but I'll make this argument. I think that it affords particular insights to what moral predispositions, moral cognitions, cognitions, emotions, and behaviors could be. An ever-expanding, iterative, and progressive way that changes as new information comes into the fold. You heard some of that this morning. The, the take-home message was, stand by, we're learning more. Bill Kaysberg said, they're not published yet, we'll hear more. This is important. It also then can utilize this information about how organisms engage potentially moral cognitions, emotions, and behaviors as part of their neuroecology to then develop various ethical systems that have been developed, have been used, etc. And why they may be important within the ecologies and niches of that time. It preserves historicity and anthropology. What may have worked 600 years ago may not be relevant now. What Aristotle may have said may have been great for Aristotle and still may be good today but I like to make the argument that if Aristotle were alive, he'd probably be a neuroethicist, and I'd be out of a job. But it also keys these as primary issues for its continued review, focus, and revision. Are we using the science in ways that are correct, or are we not? And I hold it, it may be a form of meta-ethics. And there's also been some argument about genetics being a form of meta-ethics, although that part of the human genome project failed. We didn't find the morality gene, just as we're probably not going to find the moral nucleus. We're not going to find the nucleus moralis of Kant, for example. Uh, John Shook has a recent paper uh, that he just put into, I guess it was AJOB Neuroscience, where he talks about, here's some new terms. Let's call this thing, you know, moralis X, Y, and Z, or let's call a drug such and such. I'm not going to steal his thunder. It's a wonderful paper when it comes out in AJOB Neuroscience. I recommend it to you. But as a meta-ethics, what it does is it lets us look into ourselves and say, how do we develop these moral cognitions? as part of this sort of ecological neurology that engaged and arose in us, from us, with us, as being part of our embodied brain that is embedded in the realities of that time. 
within that culture. It doesn't devoid itself from our anthropology. And it also utilizes a variety of techniques and technologies from neuroscience that can range from the synaptic to the social. And it employs those not only to understand the first tradition, how do we engage proto-ecological and proto-moral activities, thoughts, and behaviors, but then it also looks back at itself and says, how are we using these tools? Are we falling victim to a variety of our paradoxes and influences? And what I offer you is this, that neurobioethics is valid as a meta-ethics if and only if, that's the double if, if we embed it within a biopsychosocial approach. We can't simply say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the moral nucleus. I can't simply say I'm going to take a look at the collection of a group of neurons and from that extrapolate what the individual is going to do. No, I can't. Because the individual does not exist as simply a nervous system. That embodied nervous system is embedded in the psychosocial structure that has temporal, cultural, and very realistic historical implications for all of these things. And why is this important to do? For those exact reasons. For each and all of those reasons. Are there contingencies? Sure, we have to deal with them. This is the challenge posed to the field. Any emphasis upon the neural basis of anything opens a Pandora's box. Why? Because as soon as you get into the neural basis, I get into constructs of the mind-body problem, and I then have to go with some type of construct of what does it mean to have a brain and be a mind. And at very, very best, at best, these theories of how the substrate brain creates the function consciousness in mind right now remain hypothetical, if not speculative. Some are more well-baked than others, but we're basing much of this upon speculation. And if we're not going to be contingent and self-revisionist, we're screwed. Because then we're violating the primary maxim of science. And ethics by itself is called a weak science in that regard. It also dictates an appreciation of neuro-knowledge. My colleague Roger Scruton refers to a lot of this as, ooh, it's neuro-nonsense. He, he sounds so much better than my ridiculous New York accent sort of via Bavaria. But he's right, a lot of this stuff is really neuro-nonsense, babble. Let's get to the root of what neuro really means. What do we know? What can we really do with this technology? What can we not do? What are the roads ahead that say these are the principal questions that we need to ask? Do we have the epistemological, intellectual, and technical horsepower to do it? And if not, why won't DARPA fund it? And this is, this is the key at our disposal. What the neuro prefix really tells us is there's a contingency here. It forces us to acknowledge what we know, what we don't, and what may in fact not be knowable. And we can then use that in the future over and over and over again, mutatis mutandis, as we say, to use it again, but in ways that are in fact appropriate to those circumstances. It considers this. It acknowledges and appreciates the knowledge we have and the knowledge we lack. It mandates a recognition of those limitations by virtue of how we then use the tools and technologies at hand. But my argument is this. We cannot sit on our hands and say, well, let's just wait until this to be baked a little bit. Why? Because given the pace and scope of neuroscientific and neurotechnological advancement, that window of change is less than five years. These three people in the front of the room will tell you that in the past five years in their working laboratories or in the programs that they manage, and for many of you who are doing neuroscience, you know. Five years, that's dated history in neuroscience. Major constructs change. Concepts are altered. The realities shift. So it must, in fact, be something that we approach and do now. We cannot be lassitudinous or passive. Why? Because this cat is already out of the bag and people are really using this in a variety of ways, some appropriate and some not. And this is what we need to avoid. I'm all for taking an engine, Charles, you're gonna love this, I said this for you. I'm all for taking an engineering approach to studying biology and I am really convinced that unraveling consciousness is probably going to be done by an electrical engineer, not a neuroscientist, or at least the two of them working together. But you know, engineers are funny. They say, I, I can build it better. A little bit of Uber, so I can fly a little higher. There's always someone who says, wait, wait, we, we didn't build it good enough yet. And not only are you flying high, you're probably a little hypoxic, drunk on your own hubris, but you're going to fly a little too close to a sun that you can't handle, and whoa, look what happens. The challenge for contemporary neuroscience, neurotechnology, and neuroethics is to avoid Icarus's folly of hubris. Build it, do it, study it. 
but do it in a way that is technically right so that, in fact, when we're looking at the way we do things that are moral, ethical, and legal, we're utilizing these same constructs of rectitude in the way we use the science and the technology. And there are a number of tensions that are going to mitigate that. This thing called the mechanistic paradox. You heard it here this morning. We need to understand things. As scientists, certainly. Perhaps as a species, homo sapiens, cogitans. We heard that from the Evo Devo perspective that was given to you by Dr. Churchland. And that's quite the truth. We strive to know things and figure it out, and we're, we're a great species. You know, we make our own myths and then we believe them. We make our own stories. They're enough. Those are the narratives. And in fact, some of the work that I'm doing with my colleague Kai Feza at Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich demonstrate how whole construct ideas, icons, change the way the brain processes various forms of emotionality. But we're also subject to this technological imperative. If you can build it, build it. If you build it, use it. If you use it, use it a lot. It's not supposed to be used this way. That's right, though. Why? Because we could answer a question maybe here that we have to understand how it works, but is a partial explanation good enough? Good enough for what? Good enough for what? Because if, in fact, we're using this as a naturalistic basis to steer our social discourse, intercourse, relationality on a level that goes from the individual to the group to the country to the world stage, we have to be very, very careful about this. Because one of the things, as you heard from Dr. Burns, that we as humans very often are susceptible to is this thing that we refer to as Anselm's paradox. We believe such that we understand, not that we understand so that we can then believe. We go in with a particular set of beliefs and we need to be open-minded and self-critical to what neuroscience and neuroethics teaches. So how do we go forward? Well, I think that neuroethics embracing neuroscience, as you will hear this afternoon, may be able to do these things assessing trajectories for how we use the science and technology, looking at humanity as both lens and mirror. And obviously, this may mean that as neuroscience induces changes in our human predicament, condition, and human being, and as we learn more about what these ecological decisions are that we then deem as moral, we may need to shift the ethical systems we have because they may not be adequate. They may be anachronistic. And John Shook will talk to you about that this afternoon in a very good lecture that he entitles The New Ethics of Neuroethics. And I'm proud to say that we have a paper that's currently in final review in the journal Bioethics that looks at the same. But ladies and gentlemen, we have to be very, very careful. I think that the, the wisdom of the pillars of Delphi are offered to us as a maxim for neuroscience. Know thyself, certainly, as both lens and with mirror but also know thy limits of what the science and technology can do and what we can do with that science and technology. Why? This is us. This is a world that we are growing ever more knowledgeable about, and as a consequence, the burden of responsibility that we bear is great. With increased knowledge comes increased power. With increased power comes great responsibility, and that responsibility must be grounded in reality and its contingencies, a pragmatic approach. Because we run a risk here. We can get more knowledge. We can get more science. We can get more power, but it's a Faustian contingency. And the Faustian contingency, as illustrated for you here, is wonderfully put by Goethe. For those of you who are familiar with the morality play Faust, as stated, the issue here is very simple. Mephistopheles makes a bet with the deity and says, you know, you made those humans is actually a mockery on humanity. It says, you made those humans and they'll fall victim to the fact that they don't know what to do with the knowledge they have. You may put it right in front of them, but what will they do? They'll corrupt it every time. It sounds beautiful in German. And since I really miss Bavaria, I'll give it to you in German. Es nennt Vernunft und braucht es allein, nur tierisch als jeder Tier zu sein. All man needs is some set of reason to make themselves more beastly than any beast. There is great power here. Neuroscience can be used to leverage tremendous insight to what we are, to the way we are, to the way we interact, and may even be leverageable as target to change that. The ongoing work of neuroethics is to not just be proscriptive, but to think one or two steps ahead and define that territory to help to be reflective and prudent as to what that science and technology can do and what we should do with the knowledge we have, the knowledge we don't, and that which we lack. 
If you're interested in more, those are some readings. I'll be happy to provide them for you. This work has been funded by these people who believed enough in me to give me money. And if you're interested in getting in touch with me, you know where I live. Thank you very, very much for your time. <laughs> Got time for a couple of quick questions. Great talk, Jim. Um, so I just want to echo the, your emphasis on the, the people that we study are, in fact, embedded in this large social construct. And one of the challenges that I don't believe that we have solved technologically is, for example, when we scan people's brains, we are actually studying them in a very unnatural environment. And currently, there is no way around that. People come to our experiments, they go in this tube, surrounded by noise, and we somehow expect them to behave naturally. And it's a limitation mm -hmm. we have. <laughs> Right. It's huge, and I think one of the challenges, too, is to develop scientific and technological techniques that are more ecologically valid, the, the term we use, ecological validity, so that we're not putting somebody in a big tube that goes buzz, buzz, hum, hum, and go now. This is extrapolable to the entire population. Well, everybody's not in a big tube that goes buzz, buzz, hum, hum. But I think that what we're seeing is sort of a, a shift in many of these techniques. You know, think about cell phones when you first got them. They were as big as a Volkswagen. And now, I mean, they fit in your pocket. And so I think moving some of this technology in a way that engages the tools to theory and theory to tools heuristics of neuroscience and said we may not necessarily need an fMRI, but we may be able to do some other things, for example, with some of the more innovative nanotechnologies and radio frequency technologies. Interesting. It's still a question of then what are we going to do with that? Other questions, comments? I like your reference to Goethe's Faust, and I think it's interesting that whereas Marlowe and Guno damns the fellow, when Faust finally figured out what to do with the knowledge, he is saved in the end. Exactly right. It's ethics. <laughs> Other questions? In the back? And there's, there's two in the back. Thank you. Uh, I have no knowledge whatsoever about what you're talking about here. <laughs> I appreciate the invitation and I have learned a whole lot this morning. My question is this, a physical brain uh -huh. and non-physical mind, what relationship they have together, if they are the same or not, and how do they process? Who wants to get that Nobel Prize? Show hands. <laughs> That is the proverbial hard problem of, of neuroscience. Um, there are a number of ways, I, I can tell you there are a number of ways to approach that. There are those who say that simply studying the biological system with that biological system, in other words, humans studying themselves, won't be able to figure it out. That's Colin McGinn's hypothesis. He doesn't say that much anymore. He used to say that. Now he's sort of coming around saying, well, maybe we'll figure it out. I'm not unconvinced that the approach to that will be very different, that what might actually happen is we may be fostering some type of a mechanical device that then evokes consciousness, and we get a eureka moment. The reason I say that is there's precedent for that. The biologists and paleontologists looked for a long, long time at birds to figure out how to fly. It took an engineer and bicycle builder to basically do this. Although Lilienthal was the engineer and the bicycle builders, we know the two guys at Kitty Hawk, American guys, I forget their name. And so, at that point, you suddenly have an entirely new and very rapidly evolving science, aeronautics, that suddenly recognize, oh, we can apply something we knew, at least in part, which was fluid dynamics to the air, and then look what happened to the field in literally 60 years. You go from primordial flight uh, around sort of a glider and Otto Lilienthal and Dunes and Kitty Hawk to breaking the sound barrier. The engineering issue is one that may provide some capability to get around that problem, but there's still the issue of if it happens in silico or in vitro, is it the same as what happens in vivo and organic? And I, I, I have no idea. Let's take one more and then we need to break for lunch. There was someone in the, in the back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, one of the primary questions is uh, when are we going to move from uh, isolated tribes that perhaps hate one another uh, to the tribe of the whole where we understand the commonality of humanity. And I think this neuroethics is addressing some of those issues. And I, I wonder if you could take a minute to mm -hmm. focus on your prospects for a solution there. Sure. That, that's really a wonderful question. And you know, 
one of the lectures, in fact, the last set of lectures I gave with Bill Casebeer was about how we, could, how we might or should or should not use neuroscience, neurotechnology, and national security intelligence and defense agenda. And of course, that conversation very rapidly spun off to sort of us, them, Maxim, people using it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the grounding element there is very simple. It goes back to a, a variant of contact theory, which really has to do with more knowledge theory. If we understand how and that, how these things occur that we then deem to be proto-moral and what they mean and how ethical decisions and actions are in fact predicated on this and what variables contribute to those things in the external and internal environment and why they're important, perhaps in a Maslowian sense and perhaps in some brand new sense that arises out of that, well that thing just gives us a little bit, a little bit of horsepower to say, shouldn't we use that in a way that's reconciliatory? And in fact my hope is that what this neuroscientific agenda and neuroethical agenda will provide is at least a platform to be able to show those things that we have in common, what Pepple refers to as anthropological constants, and show us those areas of variance in such a way, not as to say that these are discriminably different and irreconcilable, but to demonstrate why they differed and how those differences may in fact be adaptable given that our ecology has shifted, that we're not a tribe of 150 that it takes a village. It's becoming very shifting social and cultural architectonics with a very new world geography. And I think if neuroscience has any real capability, it's to be used in that way for a form of global security, not necessarily as a form of weaponization. And Rachel Wurzman and I have studied all the nasty ways you could turn neuroscience into things that go bump in the night. The real question here is, okay, we've got this thing called neuroethics. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to use it? What's its value? Not only what's its value, but is there some veridicality to this? So we can actually look to these tools that we're using in neuroethics and say, yeah, this, this is, we should do this. And we have to then ask, perhaps, can neuroscience tell us what we should do based upon the way our brains work? in such a way as to say, well, these are the way we think about certain things, and insight to those things may help to guide us. Or might it simply be that neuroscience is descriptive and therefore neuroethics needs to be descriptive and not necessarily prescriptive or proscriptive? Look, I don't know the answer.